Good evening, everyone. I'm going to take just a couple minutes before we get started to let people join. All right, good, again, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for the fourth and final webinar in this webinar series collaboration between the Reading League of Georgia and the International Dyslexia Association, Georgia branch. My name is Lisa Murray and I serve as vice president and proud member of the IDA Georgia branch board and co-chair of the webinar series. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for their generous support in making this incredibly informative Spotlight on Structured Literacy webinar series possible. I would also like to take a moment to thank the members of the IDA Georgia and Reading League webinar series planning committee, including Kim Day, my co-chair, Jennifer Lindstrom, Anne-Marie Lewis, Jen Birch and Nora Schlesinger, Rachel Pierce and Delilah, Delilah Landrum, Mary McPherson, and Ashley Edwards, Elizabeth Hogan, and Nicole Vella with the Reading League Georgia. The focus of this webinar series is to shine the light both on the content and the principles of instruction supported in the research on teaching reading. Structured literacy instruction emphasizes teaching reading skills explicitly and systematically. And we have heard in the first three webinars in the series from some outstanding experts in the field on best practices in teaching reading and writing. And this evening's expert practitioner will focus primarily on the latter. Tonight's presentation, Writing and Content Unite, Creating Expository Writing Units, is brought to you by my esteemed colleague, Laura Dreyer, who I will introduce to you in a moment. If you have any questions you would like to ask, please put them in the chat at any time throughout the webinar. The last 15 minutes of tonight's session are reserved for answering your questions. So we will be monitoring the chat for your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer them in that last Q&A portion of the webinar. Because we have so many attendees tonight, please reserve the chat for questions only. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Laura Dreyer. Laura is a teacher at the Skank School here in Atlanta, Georgia. Before moving to Atlanta, Laura worked at the Windward School in New York as a teacher and staff developer. For more than a decade, Laura has supported students with language-based learning disabilities, their teachers, and their parents through classes, presentations, mentoring, and private tutoring. She is a recipient of the Isabel Greenbaum Stone Master Teacher Award and holds certification from the International Multisensory Structured Language Education Council, IMSLEC, at the teaching level. Laura earned a master's degree in literacy and will begin pursuing, pursuing a doctorate in education through the University of Florida in May. Thank you so much, Laura, for being a part of our webinar series and take it away, Laura. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry, I was going to take a second to share my presentation. All 
Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Lisa, and thank you to Georgia IDA and the Georgia Reading League for inviting me to present tonight. If you missed any of the previous sessions in this series on teaching reading fluency, syntax, or teaching and assessing English language learners, I highly suggest that you watch the recordings. The previous presenters have set a very high bar, and I'll do my best to meet their standards. I am very enthusiastic about creating writing curriculum and teaching writing to the point that I could sit in a room and talk about it all by myself for an hour, which will work so well for our Zoom webinar format. So I wanted to start by rolling out my goals for the evening. You will hear later that I love a good outline. So we'll start by looking at why writing is important and how our country is doing at teaching a student's writing. After that, we will explore what the research says are the best practices for effective writing instruction and look at how you could implement that in your classrooms and schools. After that, I will outline the process that I use for developing expository writing curriculum. And then I'll share some examples of writing units for different topics and different skill levels and kind of following a different amount of rigor. And finally, there should be time for any questions that you have. So we begin with the writings on the wall and the laptop and the tablet and the phone. Um, you'll find out during this presentation too that I really love idioms and puns. And I've worked with students with language-based learning disabilities for almost 15 years. So I really relish any opportunity to be playful with language. So please laugh along with me because I think I'm very funny. So writing is such an important and powerful tool. I mean, if you think about one of the things that authoritarian governments do is they ban books and texts because they understand the power of the written word. But writing is such a useful tool for communication. I mean, I think about just how I use writing in my everyday life and I really treasure ways that I've communicated in writing with people over the years. I still have letters that my grandmother wrote to me when I was younger. Um, writing is such a powerful tool for learning. One of the best strategies that I still have if I want to remember anything is just to write it down. Writing is also important for self-expression. A lot of people find relief um, journaling to sort through their feelings and emotions, and then other people are talented to the point that they can use writing for high art through literature and poetry. But even if you aren't the type of person who wants to change the world with the power of the written word, you still have to learn how to write well because of the internet. So it's pretty hard to function successfully right now if you can't write clearly and um, if you can't co communicate clearly in the written form. I know I've developed a life for myself where it's not a major liability that I never really mastered the periodic table of elements but I couldn't really get too far if I wasn't able to write well. Um, there's a study that found 70% of salary jobs require some form of writing. There's so much communication that we do now through email and through texting that it's really essential that people are able to co communicate that way. Um, if you're trying to share this with your students and they don't seem very motivated by future employment, you could also tell them that a lot of relationships are beginning through apps now and kind of start through texting. So that might be another good reason to get those writing skills down. I don't know if you wanna tell them that they need to pay attention in writing class or no one will ever date them, but you know, you, you know your students the best so you can decide what to do. So it just goes hand in hand that writing is important and it's also incredibly difficult. Writing is the most challenging thing that we ask our students to do for a variety of reasons. So the language that we write is different from the way that we speak. Um, there are so many grammatical structures that we use in our writing that people don't use when they're speaking. People don't even really speak in complete sentences. You need so much more precision and clarity when you're writing. If you make any kind of mistake in your writing, it's up and kind of frozen there on the screen or on the page, and it undermines the authority of the writer and can distract the reader from the overall point of what you're saying. Um, when we're talking to people, we can 
rely a lot more on facial expression, tone, body language. I mean, you can just see um, how many different meanings the word no can take on based on the type of face that I'm making. No. 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 So all of the hand motions and the volume and the tone really change the meaning of just that one syllable when I'm speaking to you. But if I was writing that, it would all be lost. And finally, writing involves so many different cognitive processes. As people are writing or as students are writing, they have to think about the content and what it is that they wanna say. They have to think about um, any grammatical structures or sentence starters they wanna use. They have to think about vocabulary. They have to think about spelling. They have to think about handwriting or word processing. And all of that is going on at the same time, which is a lot for the brain to deal with. And it is especially taxing on working memory. Um, so this is the first prop time of the presentation, so get ready. So think of your working memory as like your brain's post-it. Your working memory is your ability to hold on information while thinking about something else. So that would be like taking notes during a lecture or solving a multiple step math problem in your head. So imagine like this is an average working memory. So any information that can fit on this post-it would be what you can fit on the working memory and hold on to while you're trying to do all of the same things at once. But the thing is not everybody has the same working memory. So I think my working memory is more like, like this size. So I need a few, a few more strategies. Some lucky people might have like this for their working memory. So if I had this, I'd just be walking around the street solving long division in my head just to kind of show off. A lot of my dyslexic students have a working memory that's more like this, so they need a lot of strategies. But whatever your working memory is, that's all you have. So if you have this working memory, you're not ever going to get here. You just need to develop strategies to help your brain hold on to all that information. So with writing, I'll put these down because I'm losing my working memory. With writing, we have to give our students those strategies to make the most of their working memory so that they're not jamming everything onto the post-it at the same time. So now that you know that writing is important and it's hard, let's see how we're doing. So I found a study in 2003 found 70% of students in grades four through 12 were low achieving writers. The ACT found that a third of high school students who intend to enroll in college do not meet benchmarks. So these are students who want to pursue a higher education, but their writing skills are not, have not um, pre prepared them for that academic stretch. American businesses spend approximately $3.1 billion each year re remediating their employees' writing. And the most recent NAEP or Nations Report Card found that 27% of students in grades eight and in grade, grade 12 scored proficient or higher on their writing assessment. So it's clear that there's also a lot of room for growth, um, but that we really need to do better. So here's my first um, big idea for solving this problem. Oop, not yet, that one. So assigning writing is not the same thing as teaching writing. Students are not gonna get better at writing just because they're asked to do it. And a lot of people feel like, well, I assign writing, I put time aside for writing every day in class, why aren't my students getting better at it? And it's because just writing is not gonna give them the deliberate practice that students need in order to improve at it. I've been running for 10 years and I'm not getting any faster because I'm not really trying to work on any skills. I'm not changing my route. I'm not timing myself. And that's okay because I'm training for old age and not a marathon. But with writing, the students really need to be taught those skills in order to improve. If they keep trying the same assignments over and over again with the foundational, same foundational or lack of foundational preparation, they're really not going to improve. Um, I also wanted to be clear that I don't think, I don't wanna blame anybody for this, but Teachers aren't graduating from teacher preparation programs with the knowledge that they need in order to teach writing, not on the undergraduate level 
or the graduate level. I was just saying that I have a master's degree in literacy, but in that over the course of the 40 something credits I took, I took one class on teaching writing and it did not prepare me to teach writing well. And it especially did not prepare me to teach writing to students with learning disabilities. Look, it's a pun. So compared to the volumes of research that are available on reading instruction, the research available on writing instruction is pretty paltry, but you can still look to the experts to see what they recommend for effective writing practices in your classroom so that you too can have the right stuff for teaching writing. I saw this graphic um, created by Nancy Young in Margie Gillis's presentation, and then the principal of Skank also hung it on the door outside of her office. So it just felt like a, like a message that I should include it here because it does show students and the ladder of reading and writing. So the students that I work with would usually be in this part of the graphic. These are the students who really need um, systematic, explicit, intensive in instruction in order to be able to read and write well. And then as you continue up here, it's still estimated that about 60% of the students in the country would fall under this bracket where a structured literacy approach is likely a, a essential. As you get to this other group of students, who don't really struggle as much when they're learning to read and write, you can see over here that having facets of a, liter of a structured literacy approach will still be val valuable to them. And then even for students up here, having a structured literacy approach, can st there are still aspects of them that can help them even though they'll need other e extension and enrichment beyond that. So this type of approach to teaching writing that I'll be explaining using the principles of structured literacy, it's not just for the students who fall in this category who absolutely need it. This approach will really help all students. And I tell my classes every year that I was probably, I was around here somewhere when I was in school. I didn't really struggle to learn how to read, but once I started teaching a more structured writing program, I found that my writing got a lot better. So even though I felt like I was fine at writing all, all through school, once I started to learn like the real principles of writing to the point that I could teach my students, it made my own compositions a lot better. So I took these, um, or these principles right off of a fact sheet from the IDA website. There are a lot of schools and classrooms that use the, these principles of structured literacy instruction for reading, but they haven't necessarily moved them over into writing, and they should. So you want your writing instruction to be explicit. The student should know exactly what you want them to do and how they're going to do it. Because you have to remember that writing is not a natural process. It's not like speaking. We're not going to just naturally discover how to pick up a pencil and start writing down our ideas. Writing is an invented burden that's imposed on brains that were never designed to do it. So almost everybody is going to need some type of direct instruction in order to become skilled writers. Your writing instruction should also be systematic and cum cumulative. So you want each lesson to build on top of the next. If you find your students don't really know the difference between a sentence and a fragment, they're not ready to then start writing paragraphs. They need to have some foundational sentence skills and then understand the difference between a topic sentence and a detail sentence before they're ready to move on to that point. You want your instruction to be hands-on, engaging, and multi-sensory. So a lot of students have really mastered the art of acting like they're paying attention without actually paying attention. And you don't want to um, really leave anything up to chance. So as you're teaching writing, the students should be responding to you orally. They should be writing responses down. They should be seeing other examples of what you're talking about so that they're really forced to participate. And you want to make it as engaging as possible. One of my early mentors when I was in, a new teacher told me that you really have to dance when you're teaching writing, which resonated with me because I can dance all night. And then finally, you want your instruction to be diagnostic and responsive. 
Well, obviously you'll make up goals for what you want your students to accomplish over the course of the year. But if you find out in the middle of a year that, oh, I thought my students knew the difference between a cause and effect word and a change of direction word and they don't, you're gonna to have to stop and teach them where they are instead of where you think they should be. So these um, elements of effective adolescent writing instruction come from a meta-analysis called Writing Next. It was um, Steve Graham and Dolores Perrin read a lot of writing research and they analyzed all of the research that they read to find what the most effective interventions were. And then they listed them by um, a, a effect size. So number one is the most effective and then down to 11 is still effective, but maybe not quite as strong. I'll walk you through these strategies because some of them aren't necessarily apparent from their names. So writing strategies, um, they say students should be taught strategies to plan, revise, and edit their work. And students should be taught strategies for summarizing. It can benefit students to work with their peers throughout different parts of the writing process, especially if you're able to pair a more skilled writer with a less skilled writer. The students should know exactly what it is you're expecting them to create. Using word processing is helpful for students because it can make it easier for them to get their ideas out. It makes it easier to edit their work. It's also really helpful for spell check. Uh, the research supports using sentence combining as a method to teach the students how to write more so sophisticated and complex sentences. Students need to be taught strategies for pre-writing. Inquiry activities are activities where the students look at concrete data and then um, analyze that to include in their writing. The process writing approach means finding um, ways for students to extend their writing to maybe carry them out to authentic audiences beyond their teachers, even though teachers are really the people who end up being the main audience for their students' work, they're not the most motivating. And uh, research has found that students write better if they're writing for more than just their teachers. Students should study models of, of good writing to look at what makes that writing so fantastic and kind of pick apart those pieces to see what they can include in their own. And then finally, um, writing for content learning can be powerful to help the students learn new information. So the authors of this study found that these are all elements that should be included in writing instruction. They don't make up a full writing curriculum. You can impose them in what, or you can include them in whatever you want. Also, they noted that certain students will need more emphasis on some elements over others, and that a lot of them take multiple exposures before they're effective. So if you teach your students some pre-writing strategies one day um, or summarization, and then find that after their one day on summarizing, they're not able to give you a concise summary of the Odyssey, just keep going, give them more practice. Um, now, it does say that these are for adolescents, but a lot of these can be applied to younger students as well. And if you want more recommendations broken down um, by grade level for how to carry these out in a classroom, you can look at the Institute of Education Science Educator Practice Guides, which are available for free from the Department of Education. Now, the strategy or the element that was most uh, recommended by Writing Next was teaching writing strategies and to teach them e explicitly, but it's hard to kind of get to the point that you're teaching your students e explicitly and then they're using the strategy on their own. So when you're first teaching the students the strategy, they need clear instructions. Although a lot of students can identify what writing is good and what isn't, kind of figuring out how to break it down and created on their own is really hard. So you want to be extremely clear when you are telling the students what a strategy is, when they'll use it, and why they'll use it. Once, um, once the students can know what the strategy is, then it's their chance to practice it. So you want to model the strategy for them a lot and then give them time for oral practice. Not all writing class has to be written down. 
since oral language can help inform written language, they go hand in hand and it gets more students involved if they can just respond orally instead of needing to write down all of their responses. And I, I don't know if I'd say I, I, I overmodel. I really like to model the entire writing process from beginning to end for my students. And Skank had a had an a, a alumni event last weekend, and one of my students from last year came um, was talking to me, and she's like, "Oh, I was just writing a paragraph, and you were in my head." I'm like that probably because I just talked about writing so much and going through the steps so many times that one year later I'm still in my students' heads. But a lot of students really need that kind of direct guidance. However, as the students show that they understand what you're talking about and they're ready, you have to push the responsibility onto them because the fact is you're not going to be with them forever and they need to be able to carry out these strategies on their own. So basically what I'm saying is don't push the students to work independently until they're ready, but then don't always keep them with you because then they'll never be ready. So that's really easy, right? So I have um, a video clip, or it's more like a series of clips from my sixth grade classroom. And I'm introducing the concept of relative clauses. So you'll see that I start by really talking a lot to the students about what the strategy is and how they'll use it. And then as they show me that they understand what I'm talking about and that they kind of understand how to put the sentences together, I push them to work more independently. But I'm constantly obsessing them by asking questions and then checking their work on my iPad to make sure that they're with me. We are going to talk about another strategy for adding information to your sentences. These will be relative clauses. They're likely positives. Mm -hmm. Here's your, here's your grammatical definition. A relative clause is one kind of dependent clause. It has a subject and verb. It can't stand alone as a sentence. It is sometimes called an adjective clause because it functions like an adjective. It gives more information about now. So what do relative clauses do? <laughs> what do relative clauses do there? Um, gives more information about now. Yes. All right, so we're going to look at what you need to create a relative clause. Here are your relative pronoun options. You have who, which replaces the subject pronoun I, he, she, we, and they. Will someone read the example using who? Jackie Boy. This is the man who broke the window. Mm -hmm. So our relative clause there is who broke the window. <laughs> To use which for clauses that you use which are almost always non restrictive. That means the information is not essential. You want to read that example? Yeah. Um, my precious blue lamp, which has or which was in the room, was broke. Mm -hmm. So the relative clause in that sentence is you see that? Yes. And what is that describing? Which was in the room describes. Yes, good job. The precious blue lamp. Mm -hmm. So that's assuming other information about the precious blue lamp. It is now your turn to identify relative clauses. Oh. You're going to unwind them. Are you going to read that one? Oh. Okay. Uh, to whose grades are low and drop. And draw one test for mm -hmm. So students underline the relative clause in that sentence. It's in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a sentence. You can hear it about where to find it. Two questions, if you found it. Do you want to read it, Addy? Good. Let's see, I think if you change it. Oh, good. You made your decision. And then, Addy, what's the relative pronoun in that relative clause? Good. All right. The fourth one. You want to read it, Chad? Yes. Go ahead. I have one question. Okay. Why is that like this? Like the end of the words, we just highlight everything that's. No. So here, I'm going to walk you and then show. So, Barry, Barry did a nice job here. So bear recognizing whose is our relative pronoun. The relative clause is just this information and tells you more about the students. 
So the students whose grades are low, give me more information about this now. And then that's just our predicate. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like an imposter, but just forgot the commas. Yes, yes, that's mm -hmm. what I said, like an impositive, but not. Do you feel ready to combine sentences making relative clauses? Good. Because if you said no, my answer was going to be too bad. Too bad. <laughs> All right, so we have these first two. This dryer is the meditation video. The students found it the most relaxing. I'd say type this because it's a lot to write that. Yeah. So type in how would we combine those sentences using that? Fair, read how you can combine those two sentences. Ms. Jar played the meditation video that the students found most relaxing. Beautiful. What word did you have to take out from the second um, It. Yes. If it was Mr. Iron had the meditation video that the students found it most relaxing, it doesn't make sense. You don't need all that information. Just found most relaxing for your relative cause. So I'm going to try and unlock again. We're all going the same one. All right, students, I'm going to lock you. How can we combine this sentence? Bryce? Uh, should I read this one? Go for it. Okay. Um, this cat helps her students practice mind mindfulness, which is an effect, effective strategy to calm the brain. Good. Is it A, an effective strategy to calm the brain? Yes. And the strategy. Did you have that? Oh, all right. I'm going to unlock so you can make that change. Which is an effective strategy to calm the brain. Beautiful. Okay. No. Yes. So now that you are familiar with what a structured literacy approach to writing looks like and why it's beneficial, let's continue with our definitions. Expository writing is writing that explains information and informs the reader. Expository writing is supposed to be based on facts and it should be objective. Well-written expository writing is clear, concise, and linear and follows an easily detectable text structure. And you don't have to look too far to find examples of expository writing. I'm sure you created a lot of it when you were in school. So that examples are essays, newspapers, artic um, newspaper articles, instruction manuals. And the content of this webinar is also being delivered to you in an expository manner. It is very meta. So you can have your students write expository pieces about their favorite animals or holidays, but if you stick to having the students write about what they know, you're really missing an opportunity. So if you link your writing with content, it can help you assess what your students know. At the same time, writing about content helps students cement the information they're learning. Oh, um, and I wanted to include a, a excerpt or really a quote from The Knowledge Gap by Natalie Wexler, because her book, which is kind of distressing, finds that students in the United States are not learning the information that they need in order to become strong readers or even really informed citizens. So it doesn't matter how many skills you teach your students, you need to tie it to contents so that they can build the knowledge along with that skill. So you really wanna find any opportunity you can to infuse more content and information into your in instruction. And then also honestly with writing instruction, it just makes class more interesting. Even if I use the same topic from year to year, the students keep asking different questions. And I know from talking with the students and with their parents that they continue to discuss the topics and they go home over the dinner table, which I think is really great. So now that you understand why to teach um, a structured literacy approach and why to teach expository writing, let's pull it all together with what's the deal with expository writing units. So teaching expository writing units will maximize your classroom time. Right now, and this is an interactive portion, I want you to raise your hand if you feel like you learned everything you need to know about writing when you're in school and you also think you have a sufficient amount of knowledge. If your hand is raised, I want you to lower it to your keyboard and email me because I want to recruit you for my letter writing campaigns and my trivia team. 
but I know that I always feel like I always need more time for teaching content and writing with my students. So it's great to put them together. And then the students just remember the information so much more when they've spent days on it and when they've written about it. And when I design a writing unit, you can really hone in on whatever specific skills you want the students to work on. If it's a certain sentence strategy that you want them to continue practicing, or if you want to have the students um, work with one text structure again and again to really so solidify that skill, you can design your writing unit in order to meet that. When you teach expository writing units, you can explicitly teach those vocabulary and language structures that are unique to writing. Because there are so many structures that I have my students use in their writing that we don't use when we're speaking. Like I rarely will start a sentence with a subordinating conjunction if I'm having a discussion. Or I mean, I love using a positives in my writing, but when I use them in my speech, it sounds a little bit contrived. Also, the research has found that Having the students really break apart those complex structures when they're writing will help them understand them when they read. So it's easier for students to sort through sentences that might have multiple phrases and clauses if they've written sentences that have multiple phrases and clauses. And you can guide them to do that when you're developing your expository writing units to make the students do exactly what you want them to do. And then beyond that, most writing assignments that students are asked to complete in middle school, high school, and beyond are e expository. Typically in younger grades, students are asked to write um, stories or about personal e experiences, but they absolutely can create these expository pieces that will set them up for success as they continue on with their academic careers. And if you still aren't sold on the idea of teaching expository writing and um, expository writing units, then let's just go back to our elements of effective adolescent writing instruction. The units that I'm going to show you will hit all of these elements as they are, but you can even keep going because if you have students who you can group together during this process, you can work on collaborative writing. If you can extend it so that the students are able to um, write to different audiences or extend with their writing, you can include the process writing approach. If you have based your unit on a very well-written article, you can have your students appreciate those elements. And then you have study of models. And look, there you go. You really can have it all. So hopefully at this point, you are now totally ready, you want in, you want to build those writing units. So buckle up, I'm gonna show you how you can do it again and again. And the units that I made have activities that were recommended by um, Teaching Basic Writing Skills or the Writing Revolution. They're both based on the Hockman Method, which was created by Judith Hockman. Um, and then also the activities come from recommendations from the Winward Teacher Training Institute, which is called um, the Winward Institute now. And so Judith Hockman was the former head of the Winward School, and she developed this writing program when she was there just because she noticed that the students didn't write well and there wasn't really any program that was going to help them. As the students who all had language based learning disabilities left Winward and went to other schools in the New York area, their teachers were impressed with their writing skills. So schools started to send their teachers to Winward to learn the program. And I felt lucky because when I started working at Winward, I was able to take a lot of those workshops taught by Dr. Hoffman before the Atlantic wrote an article about her partnership with a high school in Staten Island. And then she became well known throughout the country and maybe the world. So part of the beauty of this writing program is that you can use this to create a writing unit on anything you want. But what makes this program daunting is that you have to create all of it. And it can take a lot of work when you're getting started, but don't, don't be scared. I've made countless writing worksheets, so many writing units, and I've lived to tell the tale and I continue to share my enthusiasm for creating writing curriculum. So you're gonna love it. Your first step is to pick your topic. So think about what it is that you're covering in social studies or science. 
Uh, recently with my class, we were studying um, plate tectonics and science. So in writing, we read an article about the fight over the dirt in um, the ancient city of Pompeii and whether archeologists should be able to study it or volcanologists. You want to pick something that will be very interesting for your students because you are going to be spending so much time on these units. And just use kind of whatever your class in, enjoys. So I gave some examples of sources where I found units, or articles for units recently. Um, but lately I've been using a lot from News, Newsella and um, StoryWorks. And I do recommend that you try to pick topics so you can use more than one year. So if you pick something that is very current, it will be great for the moment, but then you can't use it again. Obviously you want to cover current events with your students, but if you consistently create units on current events, then you're gonna be doing a lot of work. If that's what you wanna do though, go for it. So the first unit I'm going to walk you through is one that I made for my sixth graders a few years ago. They were new to the program. We had deconstructed one paragraph about how the sandwich got its name. And then we wrote our first paragraph together about the invention of the potato chip. So sticking with that food theme, I, the story works of the, uh, arrived and there was an article about how macaroni and cheese was imported from France. And then one about the science behind the creation of chicken nuggets. My students decided to go with, with chicken nuggets. So here we go. So when you have your article, you want to break it apart and annotate it. So before you read it with the students, make sure that you can understand what the main idea um, and the key points are of this article. And then look to see if there are any content specific terms that you might need to directly teach to your students or even if there are any juicy high, the high utility words that you want to embed into your writing activities. Um, sometimes at this point you might be like, oh, I found this article, it's a topic I really like, but there's just not enough content to it. You can use it for one or two days and just make a few sentence activities for it. I mean, not everything has to be a huge unit that's going to take you weeks to complete. And I recommend that you plan to read the article with your students and really sell it. So you want the students to be excited about the topic that you're reading and you want them to understand it. Um, I do have a little disclaimer because I'm notorious for overselling the topics to my students. And sometimes I go for the excitement and go just a little bit too far. I had a student pass out once when we were reading an article um, about the symptoms of yellow fever. So I don't recommend trying to elicit that type of visceral response, but like just up to it. So you can think about finding other pictures that you could include or video clips. I also will tend to do a little bit of extra research beyond what's in, in the article so that I'm ready to answer any questions that the students have and also so that they think that I know everything. And this is just a little reminder for you about what the expository text structures are. You want to make sure that you can identify the dominant text structure of your article um, and then make sure that your students are aware of it as well. And picking this out will also help you figure out what type of sentence activities and what type of paragraph or essay you're writing. You can mirror the text structure in your own writing. And then if you have a compare and contrast article, that's really great if you want your students to practice writing change of direction sentences. So I create a graphic organizer when I'm starting with a writing unit because it's helpful for me to kind of pull out the main ideas of what the article of what the article hits. Um, and then you can give this copy to your students as they're going through the writing unit. It's especially helpful for them if um, deep decoding is challenging because they won't need to skim through an entire article to find the information that you want them to include in their sentences. This graphic organizer is written in keywords and phrases, which the students, I teach my students to use for out, outlining and note taking. Um, and then I'll also write notes on the board frequently in keywords and phrases. It's such a helpful way to just get information down quickly without having to write too much. When I've tutored students in middle school and high school, 
one of the quickest shifts that they make is using keywords and phrases for note taking. And I really wish that somebody had taught me how to do this before I was 22, because it would have made me a much more efficient student to the point that now I have to get a doctorate just to prove that this strategy is helpful. So I have another um, video clip I'm going to show you from my classroom. So my students had read an article about wind power, and I used the geo on the board to help them kind of summarize the main points of the article. So you do want them to have a lot of practice taking those keywords and phrases and converting them into sentences, but you can do it orally so that more students can be involved and then it can move quickly. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the history of wind turbines and wind power. Who can tell me about the first use of wind power? All right, what can you tell me, Jack? So it was first, uh, the Egyptians used it in 3200 BC. Mm -hmm. Good, and what did they use the wind for? So, mm -hmm. good. And then who are the next people to come up with a new invention for wind? Um, the Persians, uh -huh. um, and they used to, in, in 700 CE, mm -hmm. and they used it to grind, grind, grain, and pump water. Great. So Wonderful. All right, so now we'll go to wind power today. What do we call machines that collect the wind's power today? Yeah. Wind turbines. Tell me more about them. Uh, there's, they're really tall machines mm -hmm. that harness wind mm -hmm. and have long big I don't know, blades, but you call yeah. them blades. Have long blades that spin. Mm -hmm. And after they harness the wind, what do they do with it? Uh, they create, there's a generator on the back that creates electricity that gets sent. Nice. All right, so I mean, tell us about how the blades turn and they drive the generators and create electricity. All right, so what do you call a power plant of wind turbines? Jimbo. Uh, 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 a mountaintop. You call them a mountaintop? No, they do. <laughs> what do you call them? <laughs> you point, okay, call them wind farm. Mm -hmm. And where can you find wind farms? Mountaintop and coast. Jimbo, why would wind farms be built on mountaintops and coasts? Because it's good at nice. Yes, and more than just a nice breeze, but yeah, yeah. And then how do, or how does energy from wind farms get to where people are using the energy? Addy? Uh, power through. Uh, it goes through a big It goes through electricity and then it goes through power and it's not going to be a lot of energy. Yeah, so we have our multiple turbines. The, like the, which convert the power to electricity, send it to power grids, and then send it to homes. And what do we know about the future of wind power? There, um, many states in the United States are looking to hire their percentage of wind turbines. Yeah, yeah. they want to increase the number of turbines. Yeah, to um, get rid of um, um, what you call them? um fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So that can the um. Or, 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 yeah. yeah, and there are other sources, renewable sources of energy that are being used, but what's special about wind power? Um, that, oh, it's, um, you don't have, it's um, easier, it's easy to get, you don't want to have wind, mm -hmm. and you don't have to, um, um, kill dinosaurs and wait millions of years to get them. Yeah, so you don't have to create dinosaurs and then kill them. And, and then bury them, and then wait millions of years for the dinosaurs to turn into oil. Yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah. helpful. <laughs> All right, who can tell me about our wind leader in the world? Bryce? Um, landmark, they would like, uh, what are they going to do? 47% last year. Yeah, so they want so they want to be at the center of Mm -hmm. But they are at 48%, so they basically get to 84% by 2035. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I know it's hard to see what was on the graphic 
organizer from um, the viewpoint of my camera, but the students were giving me information beyond what was just listed in the keywords and phrases, which is exactly what you want them to get used to doing from creating an outline, which I'll show you very soon. Because that outline is just supposed to give them enough information to then remember the other details that would be a, a, a associated with those keywords and phrases. So once you have broken apart your article, you get to plan your sentence act activities. And the, um, the writing units really rely a lot on spending time on the sentence level. So just like when you're teaching reading, you start by looking at sounds and then building up to words. When you are teaching writing, you want to spend time writing sentences and teaching them how to write a good sentence as you are building on to paragraphs and essays. And it's just so much easier to help the students write sentence by sentence. It's easier to see what skills they've mastered and what they still need to work on. It's much easier to help the students re revise one sentence instead of a long convoluted air-ridden paragraph. And then also, if they've written so many great sentences leading up to their essays or paragraphs, it kind of helps, it, it sets them up for su success when it's time to write those longer pieces. So when I'm first introducing a sentence skill, I usually have the students um, write about what they know. So I usually create sentences that are about the students or about my dog because, or my dogs, because that's a lot, um, it's a lot for them to think about at once because you want to think about, the working memory again and having to come up with content along with a new writing strategy. So you kind of move the content out while they're working on the strategy. But once they have been introduced to those skills, then just embed it into your content and keep practicing it. So when you are designing these um, writing act activities, you can also think about what the students will complete in class, maybe they'll need more support for it, and then what they would complete for homework because I have my students write sentences daily for homework just to keep that practice. Um, my word of warning is to try out your activities before you expect the students to complete them, especially when you're getting started. I've made a lot of writing activities where I'm like, oh, this is so great. This is gonna generate the most beautiful sentences ever. And then I realize that they're impossible to complete. So even now um, I've been working with this program for a while, Every time I create something I want the students to complete, I'm always anticipating what their responses will be to make sure that it's feasible. So this is um, because button so, which is probably the most famous sentence activity from the writing revolution. You start with the same stem and then have the students complete the sentence with, with the conjunctions because, but, and so. So they're forced to think about um, a reason why change direction or show a cause and effect relationship. These get pretty easy to create once you have the hang of it. Um, my only word of warning is make sure the students can't cheat when they're creating their so sentence. For example, if you started with the um, sentence stem, I love ice cream because it cools me off on a hot day. I love ice cream, but it gives me brain freeze when I eat too quickly. I love ice cream so much. So you want to make sure that the students have to work. You can have the students um, take fragments and then re repair them. So give them a group of words that you can tell them for certain are not sentences and then tell them that they need to embed them in their own sentences. Um, if you want to make this harder for the students, you can give them a list of some sentences and sentence fragments and then have the students kind of pick out what, what the fragments are and repair them and then capitalize and punctuate the sentences. If you want to make it really hard, you can um, give the students a paragraph that has a fragment or two in it, and then the students have to identify what the fragment is and, um, and then repair it in a way that would fit in with the paragraph. You do always want the students, though, as soon as they see the fragment, to turn it into a complete sentence. You can have the students practice converting keywords and phrases into sentences as a discrete skill for a writing worksheet because it is so important for out outlining and for note taking. And you want them to have a lot of practice using the symbols and abbreviations and understanding what they mean because they'll just make them more efficient students. You can also give them this type of activity flipped 
where they have a complete sentence and then you want them to underline the main ideas and then um, re reduce that to keywords and phrases. This activity gives the students the, um, the answer and then they have to come up with the question, which is why it's called Jeopardy. And it's a really, it's a really challenging language task for some of them, but it kind of helps them see the relationship between these question words and the information. If you want to make it a little bit easier for your students as they're getting started, you can give them the question word so that they know what word they're using to start their question. But I was just correcting some of this work that my students handed in this morning and with practice, they've gotten really good at it. Sentence expansion is probably my favorite of the writing act activities. You start with a short, kernel sentence. So here it's, they hired Robert Baker. And then you prompt the students with question words to add more information to that sentence. Um, in the writing revolution, Dr. Hawkman recommends that you always have the students when they put the information together, start the information that tells when. So that would be this bottom sentence here, um, because that's a structure that the students encounter a lot in um, when they're reading, but it doesn't happen very much when you're speaking. At Winward, we would encourage the students to find as many ways as they could to put the information together without changing the meaning of the sentence, because it kind of teaches them to be more flexible with their language. Um, and then also just forces them, if you're doing this as a group, to get more students involved in participating and then to hear the information again and again. And um, just a few warnings when you're creating these kernels, make sure that it's a real sentence. Like they are would not be a good kernel because it's not a complete thought. And you don't want to include too many pronouns in your sentence, in your kernel sentences because it just opens doors for confusion. Like they hired him. It's just unclear who hired whom. It's too much. I like to use sentence expansion um, kind of summarize an idea at the end of a, of a lesson because you can get so many students involved in repeating key information again and again. Um, just one more note with this sentence, because there's information that says where. You can encourage students to start the um, their expanded sentence with information that says what, when, who, why, but if you start the sentence with information that says where, it can come out sounding really awkward. Like across the nation, Chicken McNuggets were a hit in 1983. Mm. Teaching the students about the different sentence types um, will help them add some more variety to their writing. And then also using an interrogative or an exclamatory sentence is a really easy jumping off point for writing topic sentences. Because even though I'm never going to stop writing sentences with my students, I want them to be able to write paragraphs pretty quickly so that they feel like they're moving forward and they can have that extra practice. So after you have done all of the reading together and then you've written all of those sentences together, the students are gonna be like, let me add it. I'm ready for this paragraph. It's going to write itself, but don't let them. They're not ready. Um, they need to create their outline. So when I was a student, I thought that writing an outline was a waste of time. And I know now that's so wrong. So here I get my little post-it back because remember writing is one is a task that requires so many cognitive processes at once. And one way to kind of reduce that cognitive load is to have your plan before you start writing. Because if students have a clearly outlined paragraph and they have their organized ideas and enough information to get started, then they're not thinking about what they're writing as they are creating their paragraphs and essays. Instead, then they can think about um, what sentence strategies they're going to use or vocabulary or spelling or handwriting and typing. So it kind of just lessens what they have to do all at once. I spend as much time teaching my students to write the outline and really creating outlines together when we start this process as we do writing the essays and paragraphs. And sometimes the students are really questioning why it has to happen, what's this extra step, but it doesn't take too long before most of them buy into it and they see how much easier it is to write from an outline. A lot of my students tell me that their favorite part of the writing process is just writing the paragraph or essay because they just feel so prepared for it. And it's easy after all the work that they've done leading up to it. 
So I, I do have an outlining testimonial for my students. I am aware that student testimonials are not the most reliable um, resource if you're trying to measure efficacy. Uh, the research supports out, outlining thoroughly, but my students are just so much cuter when they're talking about it, so I had to include them. It's easier to write our paragraphs because uh, we have keep we get we can write instead of like people we can just write PPL which stands for people and then it's not as much work to, for the outline and then once it gets to the paragraph it's like really easy. Why is it so easy to write a paragraph? Because you already have it basically all outlined. You just have to put the keywords and phrases together. At the beginning of the year, I did like outlines, but now I think I'll just help. I'm so proud. <laughs> Why do you think outlines are so helpful? Because you can just like put it down in sentences because like everything's on a piece of paper and it doesn't take a lot of work and thought. So if you're writing from an outline, what can you think about? Like what you're actually doing. Like you don't like just like, like go off onto your own like, imagination. Truth from the mouths of babes. All right, oh, not yet, this one. So now you're ready to write your paragraph. And I do create the paragraph before the students write it, just because it's easier for me to guide them through the whole writing unit if I have completed the entire writing unit. Helps me figure out maybe places where the students might struggle, or if um, we can like brainstorm synonyms or certain words that they would use again and again. All right, so the last step of this process is to share. So you want to find um, someone to share the labor of love with because I love creating writing units. I find it very gratifying, but it is time consuming. And if you have somebody that you can swap units with, or maybe you can pick a topic together and then decide who will create which sentence activities or who wants to write the paragraph or essay, it makes the process easier. But it's just the beginning because after you finish your one writing unit you're ready for the next one. Um, I joke with my students that making writing worksheets is calming for me when I'm feeling anxious and um, I show them all the different worksheets that I have for the beginning of the school year because that is when I'm usually the most nervous teacher, but in spite of the volumes of um, worksheets and units I have there's always room for more you have to keep up updating them. So I'm going to show you two more units. One leads to an essay, so it's a little bit higher level, and then the other is designed for younger and less skilled students. So I made this unit on Shirley Chisholm for my students after we had studied the election um, and the structure of the federal government. So at this point, um, they, it's January, so they had been in my class for half the half of the year and they had some of the skills down and the example sentences that i'm going to show you with this unit actually came from my students classwork and homework this year truly my students did so much work for this presentation i hope they don't send me a bill so this is the famous a positives students go crazy for a positives once they learn how to write them because they do sound very sophisticated and once you get the hang of it they're not too difficult so that a, a positive is this noun phrase here the first black woman elected to congress de, um, describes shirley chisholm and the students love them but i find that if i don't have them continue to practice writing a positives they forget how to and it's a really great strategy to have on hand because a positives um, make really great topic sentences and they make really good thesis statements when you're writing essays so this is a sentence and binding activity the research in writing next found that there's actually a negative effect size in teaching grammar in isolation so somehow teaching students grammar makes them worse at it but that doesn't mean that they don't need to learn it. You want to embed it into the content that you're teaching. And one of the strategies that was highly recommended for teaching grammar is sentence combining. In this activity, the students were kind of directed to start sentences with subordinated conjunctions I provided for them, and then also include adjectives into their writing. When I was going through and correcting my students daily homework, I noticed that a number of them were making um, 
we're making subject verb agreement issues. So I made this um, I made this worksheet in the middle of the unit just to give them extra practice correctly conjugating their verbs. When I read my students' writing samples in the beginning of the year, I noticed that a lot of them make, um, they have very short sentences without e examples or they write run-on sentences. Teaching them how to write illustration sentences is really helpful because it shows them that they can write more than one sentence um, about a single detail. And then also just shows them how to add an example to back up what they were writing about. Um, I find that I use these sentence starters a lot when I'm writing, and you probably heard me say, for example, about 20 times. I use it now when I'm speaking, too. When the students write essays, they are ready to graduate to the multiple paragraph outline. So the entire um, outline is guided by a thesis statement that should be broad enough to cover all of the body paragraphs. So this is just a three paragraph essay. So you want to make sure that the main idea of your body paragraph fits under your thesis statement. And then the students learn to create the details again in keywords and phrases to fit under the main idea of the paragraph. The point of the multiple paragraph out outline is really just to plan out the body paragraph or paragraphs. The students will learn strategies for writing their introduction and conclusions separately. Just have them kind of map out that they'll have a general statement, a specific statement, and a thesis statement in their introduction and conclusion. So for this unit, I decided to stick to um, Shirley Chisholm's time in the federal government. And then the students, we looked through the article and decided what details would fit under that umbrella. Like Shirley Chisholm's time in the New York State of Assembly doesn't fit in that thesis statement because that's not the federal government. Writing introductions and conclusions is very challenging and teaching introductions and conclusions is also very challenging, but you can break it down for the students and just start by having them identify what a general statement, specific statement and thesis statement would be and just have them practice go from like the most broad to the most specific or the point of the paper. And then this triangle um, also helps them just kind of visualize what it looks like to go from the most broad to the most narrow. Um, and if you read these, you can test yourself to see if you're able to identify your general specific and thesis statements. I bet you did great. So when my students wrote this essay, they did just copy the statements or the introduction from that page, but they were ready to write the body paragraph on their own. At this point in the year, my students have had a lot of practice writing paragraphs, so they really knew kind of how to go through the process and what I was looking for. Um, thanks to all of the modeling and work we've done together, they've gotten really good at reading through their paragraphs and noticing if they have a lot of sentences that maybe start with the same words or if they use a, a specific term again and again, and they're getting good at kind of figuring out how to vary that. And this is the conclusion for the essay. Um, for this one, I just modeled how I would generate a conclusion and the students copied down what I wrote. And we talked about what it means to paraphrase the thesis statement. And I also talked about the power of including a quote at the end of your con conclusion. One of my students likes to check what I write on Grammarly and this conclusion scored pretty well, but um, Grammarly thought that some of the words in the quote were redundant. All right, so finally, let's look at a, a unit for younger students. So animals are always an engaging topic. Um, so you can see what this process would look like if you're trying to work with students who are writing at a lower level. So students who are younger, you can make worksheets that have more space for them or more structured lines, but they can still go through a lot of the same writing act activities. You can make sentence expansion even easier for students by sticking to the question words who, when, and where. How and why are a little bit more difficult. So you can hold, hold off on those if the students continue to struggle with them. This is sentence um, combining, a, again, just like I had my sixth grade students do. Um, this is just asking the students to include adjectives in the sentences. And they do have to think about what noun the adjectives belong to. 
dolphins live in large pods has a very different meaning from large dolphins live in pods. And again, I had my, my sixth grade students look at different sentence types in creating declarative, interrogative, exclamatory, and imperative sentences. For younger students, they can still look at sentences and determine whether there are questions or statements and then punctuate them appropriately. And you can still teach younger students how to use keywords and phrases. They might need fewer symbols and more written out on their outline in, in, in order to be able to use it and understand it. But they can still get that practice of looking at um, the information and then converting it into sentences. So here's, oops, there's the paragraph. Um, for younger students, I wouldn't expect them to write paragraphs that were filled with subordinated conjunctions and positives and relative clauses, but they can use conjunctions in the be in the middle of their sentences. And this type of activity can be completed with an entire group. The students don't need to all be writing their own paragraph. You can kind of model it with the whole class together. Okay, so we're coming to the end. I know how hard it is to pay attention to anything after five o'clock. So hopefully this information sounds familiar to you. If it doesn't, excellent news. This whole thing's been recorded. You can watch it again if you want to. So being able to write is difficult, but it's only becoming more important. So we need to make sure that our students are able to do it. Therefore, a structured literacy approach to teaching writing will benefit almost every student. There's no reason not to try it. Strong writing skills begin at the sentence level and they require ample deliberate practice. So once you've introduced that writing strategy, keep doing it. Never stop writing at the sentence level. Even with my students after they've started writing um, essays, I don't abandon a single paragraph. Sometimes we still go back and write a single paragraph. Don't give anything up, otherwise they'll forget it. Just have to keep practicing all of it. If you tie your writing instruction to content, you will maximize your classroom time and you're also gonna learn a lot of information. And then finally, making writing units is fun but it's very time consuming. So find people to share the labor of love with you. And thank you all for joining me this evening. If you have any questions, um, please email me. If you're serious about joining my trivia team or my letter writing campaigns, please email me. If you have written a writing unit and you're really excited, please email me. If you have any complaints, please email Lisa Murray. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. Your enthusiasm for writing instruction is contagious. I can attest to that. And I know you've inspired quite a few people tonight. Um, that coupled with some really specific and wonderful takeaways that teachers who are on the webinar can use really in their classroom tomorrow has been just a fantastic and inspiring combination. Um, didn't have a lot of questions in the chat, but what I thought I'd do, we did have some questions come in at registration. And so what I thought I'd do was um, share a few nuggets from your presentation. Do you get that reference, Laura? Oh, she nice, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that really stood out for me and kind of combine those with a couple of the questions that did come in. So um, a couple of the nuggets that were highlights for me. Um, I loved when you said that writing is an invented burden imposed on brains that weren't built to do it. I think we can all, who, all of us who work with struggling writers um, can really, that really resonates. Um, and I also loved the quote, you really have to dance when you're teaching writing. Um, teach them where they are rather than where you think they should be. Those are wise words. So this one, I have a question because one nugget that I really enjoyed was you said, link writing with content. If you stick with what a student knows, you're missing an opportunity, which I think is absolutely wise advice. What about dysgraphic students in the sense of students who have a hard time looking at a white piece of paper? So a lot of the writing strategies, um, they can be practiced orally. 
they don't all have to require students to write them down. And especially for students who might be re reluctant to write or just um, lack the stamina to continue writing throughout the class period or, or throughout the day, you can have the students just orally share information. The students can say it orally and then maybe the teacher can write it down or type it so that the students can still see it. But a lot of this practice can come from oral language and will still benefit the students, help them learn the information and help them learn those skills. And we definitely saw that in action in your class, a lot of that oral language being woven into the process. So thank you. Um, one question we did have from registration was, um, what are some examples of classroom accommodations that you would recommend for a student um, who has been diagnosed with dysgraphia and language processing disorder? So having access to graphic or organizers is really helpful for everybody, but especially for students that might struggle with processing language or with dys dysgraphia to have just more um, information in their arsenal with them as they're writing so that they don't have to kind of take in as much information or think about as much when they're creating their pieces. And like I said, the graphic organizer, if the teachers created it just as a like lay out of the main idea of an article can be so helpful just for writing on the on the sentence level because then the students don't have to dig back into their memory or go through a whole article they can see the main points right in front of them. Thank you. Um, well, a nuts and bolts question that came through the chat was are examples of sentence activities in the books you mentioned by Judith Hockman? Yes, they are. And um, and the Writing Revolution offers virtual training. Um, the Winward School also offers virtual training. So this is just like a, the, the tiniest like taste of what those writing programs look like. If you're interested, I encourage people to buy the book or sign up for more training because there's a lot to it. Yes, agreed. Um, and you mentioned that sentence expansion was one of your favorite activities. I would, I would I'm in that club as well. And would also say sentence combining is one of my favorites to do with students. And I would put a plug in for Bruce Sadler's book, Teacher's Guide to Effective Sentence Writing. That has a lot of great um, practical tips as well. Um, let's see, a couple other questions. When do you recommend introducing the vocabulary of grammar? So for example, noun, verb, conjunction, I know I hear from um, some resources that you know, it should be more about the function, like the namer or something like that. But when do you think the um, vocabulary of grammar should be introduced to students? Well, it's important that the students know what the names are so that they know what you're telling them when you're asking them to correct something. But for, especially with younger students, like just when you have language and then the language of language on top of it, it's a lot to keep track of. And I've even found with um, with my sixth graders, a lot of them understand what they need to put into a sentence, but even still when it comes to naming what those parts of speech are, they're not, sometimes they don't totally have a, a con concrete grasp of it. I think it's more important that the students can kind of tell you what the pieces of a sentence are and what each piece is doing, rather than being able to say like, and that's a prepositional phrase. It's more important like, oh, that's information that tells me where, or that tells me when, to look at how they can make their writing better and what the function of each piece of the sentence is, is more important than being able to really name what they are. And then as a teacher, you can continue to point them out to the students and name them so that they have more e exposure to the grammatical terms. But then if you start just like drilling the students and what the grammatical terms are, then you kind of get to the point of like, well, what do I really want them to know? Do I want them to know what this is or do I want them to use it? Mm -hmm. um, really enjoyed the student testimonials about um, how easy it was. To, the writing part was easy once you, you know, had built up to that, the outline and all that. So how many rewrites are ideal for students? So it's such a loaded question. And um, I think about when I was being trained in this program, I went to my writing mentor with like a stack of paragraphs that my students had written and there were so many errors in them. She's like, just wait until they leave and throw them away. <laughs> like we're not, nothing good will come from revising these paragraphs. So it's almost like 
you want to think about why the students have made the errors that they did make in the first place and what you can do on the front end to make it easier for you to revise on the back end. So if you've had them write a lot of sentences together, if they're still learning the program, maybe they weren't ready to be so independent when they were creating the paragraphs or essays, and that's why there are so many errors. I mean, I usually go back and forth with my students about two times with their pieces before we put them to bed. And I do like to kind of resolve every issue in the paragraphs or essays with my students. That being said, I have seven in my class right now. I've never had a class larger than 13. So I am able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I really think about if you're trying to think, um, kind of make the cleanest outcome is to really spend that time leading up to the paragraph and essay to get the students set in a place where they're going to be as successful as they can be. Um, okay, one last question. You, on one of your slides, you um, listed the expository text structures, the descriptive sequence or process, compare and contrast, cause and effect, problem solution. Do you, for, for students who are really struggling writers, do you have, in your experience, has, have you found, um, any one of those text structures better to start with than others? Like, is there one that seems to um, make a reluctant writer a little more, a smoother path? I mean, it's more straightforward to start with a descriptive or um, or if you're looking at a um, sequence and a, a, a numerative because they don't have to kind of change direction like they would with the cause, with the compare and contrast or they don't have to look for a cause and effect. Um, but a lot of it just depends on what the topic they're interested in, because you can find a lot of really um, interesting de de debates that the students like to write about in classroom peri per periodicals. So then you can go ahead and just have them put two sides and just make sure that they understand how to group similar I ideas together and then put a change of direction word when you're switching from one side to the other. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm looking at the time and I want just a couple of these last minutes to just um, close it out and say some final thank yous. Um, thank you all again for attending tonight's webinar. Thank you for your engagement, for your thoughtful questions. And of course, a final thank you again to our presenter, Laura Dreyer, for sharing her time and expertise with all of us tonight. Thank you also to all of our sponsors, and I especially want to acknowledge the valuable partnership between IDA Georgia Branch and the Reading League on this webinar series. We look forward to partnering on more outreach events in the months and years to come. Finally, all who registered for tonight's webinar will receive an email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to the webinar recording, as well as information about the certificate of attendance. If you do not see that email in your inbox, please be sure to check your junk and spam folders. Also, if you have colleagues who missed tonight's webinar, please let them know that all registrants will be receiving a link to the webinar with specific instructions on how to earn a certificate of attendance for viewing the recorded webinar. Thank you for attending and have a great rest of your evening.